So today I want to continue talking to you from the book of Galatians, and we're in actually message number five, and I want to talk to you specifically about living by the Spirit. Would you say that with me this morning? Living by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit. I believe that God wants to help us as a, as a church family and us as individuals to grow in our relationship with Him. To grow in our faith. And I believe that we don't want to just be powerless, discouraged, hopeless Christians. Amen? We want to live in the presence and the power of the Spirit. We want to be victorious in our Christian lives. We want to live in a way that Jesus promised. That he said, though the enemy may come to steal and kill and destroy, I have come, Jesus said... That you may have life and that you may have life to the full in abundance. And I believe that God wants to grow us this morning so that we understand even better about the true power and the true fruitfulness of what it means to live by the Spirit of God. So as we begin, before we dive into God's Word, I want us to bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, and we're going to look into your word, and we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make the written word alive to us, that by your power, you would bring wisdom, and you would bring revelation to our minds and to our hearts so that we can hear what your spirit is saying to each one of us today. Give us the power and the courage to apply what we learn today to our everyday lives. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, go to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Now, Every once in a while, um, we, we take time to actually walk through a book of the Bible. Sometimes uh, we preach on topics that the Lord puts on our hearts, but other times God will put on our hearts actual books from the Bible, and Galatians is one of those, and today we're in chapter 5, but Paul the Apostle wrote the book of Galatians, and actually it's not a book, it's a a letter, and it's an epistle that the Apostle wrote to a church that he planted, so he loves these people, he loves this church, and he wants to see this church flourish and thrive in the word of God and in their faith. And at this time when Paul wrote this letter, many Christians were being taught by false teachers. And they were being taught that they had to be circumcised. They had to follow the Jewish rules and customs in order to experience the salvation of God. But Paul comes along and says, hey, don't listen to these false teachings. Don't believe the fact that you have to add something else to your faith in order to experience salvation. He said they wanted to, if they wanted to live according to these set of laws, he said Christ could not help them. But he explained that it was not important that a person, it's not important whether a person was physically circumcised or not according to the Jewish law. But what was important was their faith in Christ. Their faith in Christ was essential. And so in Galatians chapter 5, this is where we're going to pick up today. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Paul comes in and says this. It is for freedom. Everybody say freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. In other words, we're not bound by the law. We're not bound by the power of sin. We're not, we're not under the, the Old Testament rules and regulations and Jewish customs. No, we are free. By the grace of God, we are free. And Paul says, stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In other words, Paul's saying, hey, don't listen to these false teachers that say you have to add something to your faith. No. Believe in Christ. How many of you know Christ is enough? Would you say that with me this morning? Christ is 
enough. And Paul wanted to come along and remind the church in Galatia that true freedom is about living a thank you life. True freedom is about living a want to life rather than a have to life. You see, grace changes everything. Grace leads to relationship. Religion is dead. Verse 2, Paul says this, mark my words. How many of you know if an apostle tells you to mark his words, you better pay attention. He says, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Verse 3. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Verse 5. For through the... Who? Through the Spirit... This is what we're going to talk about today. I want you to pay attention when Paul said, refers to the Spirit in these passages. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Look at, the, look at this statement right here. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Would you say that sentence with me? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, I love this because Paul right here is reminding the church that, hey, God is not looking for obedience through law-keeping, Rather, God is looking for obedience that is motivated by love, that flows out of faith. This is what Paul is encouraging the Christians to remember. He goes on in verse 7. He says this, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Verse 9. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. How many of you know that that's true if you're familiar with the kitchen? That is small things. This is what Paul is saying. Small things can have a huge impact. It only takes a few people pushing false doctrine, or false teaching to produce lots and lots of problems within God's church. And Paul says you need to be aware of that and make sure that you're not believing the lies of the enemy. So let's go to verse 13. Everybody still with me? Verse 13, Paul says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be what? Free. Free. But, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another humbly in love. Verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, Paul. I think I'm following with you what you're telling us. Is that what's, not, what's important is not that you're circumcised or not. No, you, what's important is your faith in Christ and in the grace of God that has been displayed and poured out to you. And now what's most important is that you live out that faith by an expression of love. Amen. Loving one another. Loving God. Loving people. Can it be any... Simpler? Does it have to be all confusing? Or can it really be that simple and that profound? Love God. You are free to love God. 
And you are free to love one another. So what does Christian freedom look like? It looks like serving one another humbly in love. Can I get a good amen right there? It's important to remember that biblical love is more than a feeling. Biblical love is a, is a decision to compassionately, righteously, sacrificially seek the well-being of someone else other than yourself. It's a call to forget about me, myself, and I so much. Sometimes we just get preoccupied with ourselves. But the biblical kind of love says, no, you need to forget about all your needs. Let your needs kind of be on vacation for a little bit and learn to focus on the needs of other people. Amen. And Paul calls us to remember how important Christian love really is. Just as Jesus loved sacrificially, unconditionally, righteously, humbly, just as Jesus loved, so we too are called to love one another. And by this kind of love, the world will know that we are followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. It's this love that we share one for another and that we share with our Father God through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's this love that will be a witness to a lost and a dying world. Verse 15, the apostle goes on with a warning. He says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out. Or you will be destroyed by each other. Anybody like to eat crab legs? I love crab legs. I, and you know, a person who loves crab legs even more than I do is my wife, Ashley, and our youngest son, Warner. If we ever have a special event, uh, like a birthday or a special uh, occasion, where do you want to go? Oh, we want to go somewhere with crab legs. How many of you know that one little dip in that butter? Oh, it just makes your mouth water so, so good. So why, why do I bring that up? Because it, this verse reminds me. When Paul says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by one another. It reminds me that when crabs are cooked, they're placed in a, in a pot of water, and as the water temperature begins to increase and increase, the crabs try their best to climb out, only to discover that the other crabs that are, that are in there are, are grabbing them and pulling them back down. And, and they try to climb out, but the others go grab and pull back down. You see, when a church, when church members assume this every man for himself kind of mindset rather than a let's serve one another through love mindset. You see, we will claw and we will grab one another until all of us are roasted in the pot. And so Paul comes along and says, hey, don't do that. Don't fight don't devour each other. Use your words for kindness and love and resist being a vessel of the enemy to pull each other down. But instead, we want to serve one another in the spirit of love. Amen? Verse 16, Paul continues and he says this. So I say, look at this phrase, walk by the spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not, a, you are not uh, to do whatever you want. Verse 18. But if you are, look at this phrase, led by the spirit... You are not under 
the law. So Paul in this verse right here, he's just talking about how important it is to live by the Spirit. He says, walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit. So what's his advice for living in freedom? What's his advice for living in Christian love towards one another? What's the fundamental principle for spiritual victory, for maximizing your life in Christ, for bringing the most benefit to other people? What would Paul say is the most important thing here? He says it's important to walk by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Now, let me just make a note about this because when Scripture talks about our walk, it's talking about our conduct, like the way we behave, the way that we speak to one another, the the decisions that we make in everyday life. And to walk by the Spirit means to discover God's view on a matter, It means to decide to act on that divine perspective. And it means to depend on the Holy Spirit to empower you to obey. This is what it means to walk in the Spirit. And Paul says it's really, really important that we don't gratify the desires of the flesh, but that we learn to live in and by The Spirit. Now, notice that walking by the Spirit doesn't mean resting while the Spirit does all the work. Amen? We're not to be passive, but we're to be active. We're called to walk while we trust. Walk while we trust in the Spirit's empowerment. It reminds me if you've ever been at an airport and you know you're on that one of those moving sidewalks. We see like you're, you're, you're walking in dependence on a power that's at work underneath you. You see what I'm saying? That is an example and, and an illustration of what it means to walk by the Spirit. And when Paul says be led by the Spirit, it's kind of like this idea of following the lead of a dance partner. Anybody like to dance? Come on, we're in Las Vegas. Somebody likes to dance around here. Okay. Being led by the Spirit is like following the lead of a dance partner. You are moving, but you're moving in response to what the Spirit is doing. Does that make sense? So Paul says this is really, really important if you want to learn to live the victorious, abundant life that is yours in Christ. Learn to live by the Spirit. Verse 19. It says this. The acts of the flesh. Everybody say acts of the flesh. Some Bibles, some translations say works of the flesh. But Paul says these are obvious. Let's read them. Sexual immorality. Impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. He didn't stop there. Drunkenness and orgies and the like. Paul says, I warn you. As I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's a clear warning from Paul. Watch out for the acts of the flesh. They don't lead to life. They lead to death. Galatians 5. Now let's go to verse 22. And this is where I want us to kind of think about deeply in this message. It says this. Paul says, but... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So I want you to think about this for just a second because acts or works of the flesh, there's something 
They are something that you do that, are, that is motivated by the flesh. But fruit is something different. Fruit is something produced through you as the Spirit works powerfully and as you respond to His leadership in your life. You see, the sources are different. One source is the flesh. One source is the Holy Spirit. The sources are different and their outcomes are different. But just as the acts of the flesh are visible to all, so is the fruit of the Spirit. You can't miss it. It's something that's obvious. I mean, your spouse will see it. Amen? Those who you are in relationship will see it. Your boss will see it. Your kids will see it. Your co-workers will see it. Your employees will see it. And it will make all the difference in the world. You see, everyone will see either the acts of the flesh through us or the fruit of the Spirit through us. The question is, which one are we going to allow to be our source? Which one are we going to allow to focus on? Because while the acts of the flesh destroy, the fruit of the Spirit provides life. And it provides refreshment. And it benefits not only you, but everyone around you. I want to invite you at this point in your worship guide. You received a little handout that has the, the fruit of the Spirit actually listed on there. And I put a definition of the fruit of the Spirit on there. If you didn't get one, maybe we have some extras you can look on and borrow with someone. And even if you're online, let us know that you need one and we'll send, we'll send one to you as well. But let's start with the first and, and the most important one. Love. Everybody say love. Love. This is a wonderful fruit of the Spirit. It means to seek another person's good, especially when that person can do nothing for you in return. Amen? Love. This is the Greek word that, that is agape. It means serving people for their intrinsic worth, not for how they make us feel, you know, I, I need to do the dishes. I need to do, leave notes, like love notes, not to my, to my wife because, not because she's, she always deserves it. <laughs> but because she's worthy of it. She is worthy of it. Not because I always feel like doing those things. Amen. How many of you know that there's times where we express love even when we don't feel like expressing love? This is the fruit of the Spirit coming forth through our lives. First and foremost, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The second one is joy. Joy is that settled celebration of the soul within us, even when circumstances don't make us happy, even when things are not going our way. Joy is a delight that comes from focusing on Jesus. Amen. Not on the, it's independent of the circumstances or, 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 or his gifts. Joy does not come from personal comfort or emotional highs. Joy only comes as a response to the person of Jesus Christ. This is joy, and this is something that cannot be taken away from you. No matter what circumstances may be happening around you or even inside of you. No, if you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will produce the fruit of ongoing, inexpressible joy. Amen? Amen? Not only love and joy, but also peace. And peace is something that's very lacking in this world today. But as we focus on Jesus and as we walk in the Spirit, we learn to experience Jesus' peace. It's tranquility or a calm delight. Even when life's circumstances or events don't go the way that you anticipated. Peace is a confidence 
and a rest in the wisdom and in the power of God and not in ourselves. Peace is not controlling the storm. Peace is offering your situation to Christ in the storm and trusting in his wisdom and power to work things out for your good. That, my friends, is peace. That's the peace of God. Let's go on to the next one. It's forbearance. Some versions say patience or long-suffering. It means steadfastness, even in the midst of betrayal or deep disappointment. Patience is persistently enduring without blowing up, without giving up, or without lashing out. You find your stability in knowing that God is who he says he is. He is sovereign. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in, in, in all circumstances and in all the timing of life, you learn to trust in our sovereign God. Amen? Amen? Kindness. Kindness is when we help rather than hurt. It's gentleness with others who may be weaker or less capable than you. Kindness is the ability to serve others practically, often in ways that are costly to you or make you vulnerable. And our hearts are broken by the things that break the heart of God, and we do something about it. It's active empathy. This is kindness. This is an important and powerful fruit of the Holy Spirit. Goodness. Goodness, it's the virtuous acts and attitudes that advance the kingdom of God and benefit other people. Goodness has to do with personal integrity. We speak the truth boldly and we live consistently no matter where we are or who is around us. Our thoughts, our words, our deeds, they're all in alignment with each other. This is goodness. Also, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. It's the faith in the unseen and the not yet purposes of God in you and also in others. It's that, it's that characteristic that keeps you from giving up. It brings constancy. It brings perseverance and dependability. Faithfulness is courageous loyalty. Man, I love that. Courageous loyalty. It's being reliable. It's being dependable. It's being honest, even if it's difficult for you. This is faithfulness. Gentleness. Gentleness is meekness or softness evidenced by how we handle others. Look at this. Even when they disagree with us. This quality is seen, this fruit is seen in the person who practices tenderness in submission to God. Gentleness is the humble, healing use of power. One person describes gentleness as strength under control. It leads us to his, his last fruit, and Paul says it's self-control. Self-control or temperance. It's the ability to master our passions and desires. It's when we say no to sin and yes to God, even in the midst of temptation. This is self-control. It's purposeful living. It's the ability to pursue the important over the urgent. We understand that it's time to relax versus it's time to work or it's time to spend time with family in, in, in contrast to spending time with buddies. Like It's important to understand through self-control what is right at the right time. My friends, the fruit of the Spirit is amazingly powerful. And again, it's not something that we muster up through willpower or human effort. No, it is produced in our lives by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. The more we yield to the Spirit's work in our lives, the more 
fruit will be produced through us. Verse 24. Let's go back to Galatians verse 24. It says this, those who belong to Christ Jesus have done what? They've crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And verse 25 says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, Paul's saying, hey, salvation has come to you by God's grace in the person and work of the Holy Spirit The Spirit has transformed you. The Spirit has made you new. His power has done something wonderful in you in salvation. And now, as you continue on in your salvation, it's important to keep in step with the Spirit. What does it mean to keep in step with the Spirit? It means to march in step like with your commander who can lead you. Step by step. Therefore, the Holy Spirit must be included and and we must be aware of his presence in every move that we make. In every decision that we take, we need to be aware of what the Spirit is saying if we want to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. So Paul says it's important to renounce the flesh, right? Renounce and turn away from those fleshly passions and desires, and we must learn to live by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. We learn to seek the the constant companionship of the Spirit. We go through our days and we go through our moments. And even if we're not saying it out loud, no, we're praying constantly. Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? Would you let me sense your presence? Would you let me walk in step with you? As I go into this meeting, as I deal with this difficult relationship, as I seek to love my wife or my husband, Holy Spirit, would you give me the desire and the ability to keep in step with your spirit? So Paul here isn't accusing the Galatians of not having the Holy Spirit. No, he's acknowledged that when you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. No, rather he's telling them to actively embrace the person and work of the Spirit that you've been given. So how do we apply this to our everyday lives? I think one of the biggest keys to personal application for this is simply learning To stay plugged in. Learning to stay plugged in to the Holy Spirit. You know, when we we all walk around with our cell phones, how many of you have a cell phone, right? We all we all have cell phones. There's a lot of wonderful, powerful things that cell phones can do. However powerful or useful that a cell phone may be, it has no ability unless it is plugged in. And charged up. Amen? Amen? You and I are much the same way in our Christian walk. Living by the Spirit will not happen unless you are connected to and plugged in and charged up with the presence and the power of the Spirit of God. The more you yield to the Spirit, The more you're plugged in and charged up by the Spirit of God, the more impact that He will make through your everyday life. The less you yield, the less impact. So how do you learn to live by the Spirit? Let me give you three simple thoughts. Number one is this. I will commit to prayer. Man, this is so foundational, but yet so, so important. You cannot walk in the Spirit if you never pray. Prayer is more than just a spiritual exercise or or a spiritual discipline. Prayer is our lifeline. It is through prayer that our spirit communes and fellowships with God's Spirit. It's through prayer 
that we learn not only does God hear our voice, but we hear his voice. It's through prayer that we receive the strength. Whereas my pastor friends sometimes say the unction, the unction of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God. We cannot grow, we cannot function in the abundant life, in that victorious life that Christ died to give us without prayer. I was having a conversation the other day with a friend who was struggling and, and he was having some issues with, the, with some of the acts of the flesh, some of the works of the flesh. And my question was him, was not were you a Christian? He, he was a Christian. He had been born again by the grace of God. But I ask him this, are you spending time with God? Are you having an alone time with God? Do you have a dedicated time of prayer in your everyday life? Because I told him, without prayer, you're, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. You're vulnerable to, to confusion, to doubt, to lack of faith. When you make room for the Holy Spirit, He empowers you to overcome the struggles and the temptations of the flesh. This is what it means to live by the Spirit. And as you pray, I encourage you, don't do all the talking. Learn to listen. What's important in prayer is not so much what you say, but what he says. So as you pray, learn to listen, and you will learn that God will speak to you through the Holy Spirit. You will learn that God will speak to you through the words of Scripture. He will speak to you through that time of prayer, and even through circumstances, open doors and closed doors. He will make it plain. He will speak to you. If you are listening, so commit yourself to a life of prayer if you want to learn to live by the Spirit. And you'll learn what this truth really means. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, it says, Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. I want you to walk in it. This is what it means to live by the Spirit. Number two is this. I would encourage you to commit to the Word of God. Not only commit to prayer, but commit to His Word. And to be honest with you, many people don't connect reading the Bible with walking in the Spirit. But my friends, there is a direct correlation. You see, the Word of God gives you instruction on how to live. It's the Spirit of God that gives you the power to do it. The Spirit of God and the Word of God, they work together. They work in cooperation. They're teammates, not competitors. And they work in your life as we yield to the Spirit of God and we're open to the speaking of the word of God. He works in our lives and changes us into the men, the women, the boys and girls that God has called us to be. And always remember this. This is Psalm 119, verse 105. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. His word is important. So be committed to prayer. Be committed to the word of God. And number three, I will commit to obedience. I'll commit to obey. Whatever the spirit of God and the word of God speak to me, my answer is yes in advance. I commit to obey whatever God tells me to do. No matter if I like it, no matter if I'm comfortable with it, or not. I will obey what God tells me to do. You see, quite honestly, without obedience, it doesn't matter how much you pray. It doesn't matter how much word you know. 
without obedience, those things are nice to do, but you are actually deceived. You love me, don't you? I love you too. James chapter 1, verse 22 says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Act in obedience. And this is the good part, is that when we live by the Spirit of God, He actually gives us the desire and the ability to obey. The desire grows not out of obligation, but He forms in us a heart of love. And the more that we love Him, the more we will want to obey Him. When we're living by the Spirit, we will not only read our Bibles or pray to hear His voice, but we will be empowered, empowered by the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We will be empowered to do what He says. So how do we learn to live by the Spirit? Let's just wrap it up like this. We listen for God's voice in prayer. We see God's path in his word and we follow his direction in obedience and it's all by the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in each one of our lives amen amen I want to close with this statement somebody I believe is here and needs to be reminded of this whatever you're going through whatever circumstances you're facing in this life right now in this season of your life, whether it be your marriage, your work, your personal health and well-being, anything that's going on in your life, you need to be reminded of this truth right here, that you are never alone. You are never alone. The Spirit of God is always with you. And by the promise of God's Word, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And grace upon grace is being poured out to you even in your darkest moments of life. And I want you to know today, you are never, you are never alone. You are not alone right now, and you will never be alone one day in the future. The Holy Spirit is with you every step of the way. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you for the message of Galatians 5 through the Apostle Paul. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to apply your word today to our lives, to each circumstance that we're going through, to each decision that we make today and in the days to come. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us by the power of your spirit not to just have the Holy Spirit, but to walk by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. That is true freedom. Freedom to love you and freedom to love one another. And I pray, Lord, that you would use each of our lives, Lord, to impact the lives of others. Lord, that as we live in your presence and in your power, that you would use our lives to make a difference in the lives of other people, whether it be on our job, at our church, in our family, and in our home. Father, help us to walk by the Spirit and be led by your Spirit every single day. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said... Amen. Would you stand with me, please?